Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to our final session, which is the post screening Q and A with uh, Charles Guo. So yeah, so this is going to be a probably roughly thirty minute Q and A session. Session, and I'll begin with some of my questions. So I have a few, and then uh, of course, we we'll believe uh, I believe that uh, the audience also all have questions to ask. So yeah, and I think cause, uh, previously uh, uh, we have a paper about you. So I think uh, the, the, the audience here know quite well about you as an artist, as a, a writer, as a filmmaker. And uh, so my first question um, is basically generated from this sort of, uh, you're, you're multi-talented uh, as a multi-talented person, you can uh, you write and then you direct film and then you make, you add up your own film. So the first question is about sort of uh, how does it feel <laughs> to kind of adapt your own work because uh, it's quite interesting uh, territory in a way that uh, in, in a sense that I, I kind of want to know that do you as, a, as the writer or as the author of your own work when you make your own film do you feel that do you have that kind of liberty to make whatever you want because you know you are the, the source author uh, of the novel or is it still do you still have that kind of challenge when you add up your own text to a screen? Uh, that, so that's my first question. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Lucia, who organized the conference and Mark, and everyone else involved. And thank you for Fiona, which I don't see now, but I'm sure um, it was all fine, I hope. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. Um, I wish I could. Uh, so first is this is a misunderstanding from some mistaken journalist who said that Shia Chinese was adapted from my own book, yeah. which is completely wrong information. I don't know why would anyone, you know, would, would want to check it. Um, it's our original script. Yeah. I made 12 films and I wrote 20 books. None of the films adapted from my books. They are completely separate. Oh. Only this one film called UFO in Her Eyes was adapted from my novel, but that was a very exceptional case. Yeah. So all of my films, I wrote original script, mm. which has nothing to do with my books. Oh. The Shia Chinese, if you really like want to say, is that adaptation is really to do with Jean-Luc Godard, there I say. Yes, yes. So it was a film inspired from Le Chinois in the 1960s by Jean-Luc Godard. And I wrote a script when I was really very young, uh, mm. almost almost about 30 years ago, I'm 50 years old woman. <laughs> so <laughs> I wrote that when I was in Beijing in mm. university. Yeah before I left to China. And I think it was the film, really is the last one was in the film class, which we film school students were supposed to watch. And I think we had a really kind of strange and heated debate about mm. Godard cinema and uh, everything else is fine with Godard. We're all worshiping Godard's film you know, till today. But the, I think La Chinoise was a strange case because my generation I was born during the Cultural Revolution, so yeah. my generation, our parents were in the labor camp. Mm. And my father was there more than, more than 10, 15 years because he went in the 1957 before the Cultural Revolution started. So I think it's a strange film from Parisian intellectuals in the 60s, a worship of Chinese, that time, you know, in a, in a beautiful, but naive and a romantic way. Um, I love the film language from, from Godard's film, that film. But, uh, I wondered about what what do we do if we make a film with that kind of subject from a, a younger generation in homage to Gola. So I remember I wrote a kind of film treatment um, named La Chinoise, a homage to Gola, but a reverse to journey, and that was original script. And I remember it was in Chinese, it was very kind of thematic intellectual worshiping but in a very sarcastic way to go that and that was you know nearly 30 years ago when i was very young and then 20 years passed i came to britain and i made other films and mostly i made documentary films and i wrote novels which was nothing to do with that film and then one day i remember i was in national film school in the uk and i think they had um a sort of script competition and my, my, that script, which I wrote in English then, 20 years ago, uh, received the, the script prize, which means I could develop mm -hmm. into film, but with 
Channel 4, BBC, and UK production company. And I remember the, the development of the script was complete revision of my younger youth, my, I think, sort of um, feverish but naive uh, commentary on Godas, like she was. Um, and it was very interesting, you know, I rewrote, rewrote all those years when I was in the UK's National Film School. And the final script, well, regardless, the final film was nothing to do with my final script. But the final script was really become a very apolitical story mm. about the young Chinese woman's journey to the West. And it's so removed from the reference from Jean Godard, you know, really mm. very elusive homage, unless you really know the scene by scene Godard's film very well, then you can clearly see the, the kind of the reference, but I think all the references become very hidden, and I think it's a personal journey to cover the story. And also as a result of this, you know, BBC Channel 4 mm. story development, I think there's so much into narrative than intellectual um, kind of comparison mm. uh, with French 60s um, intellectual ideas. So as a result, um, the film was so far away from, you know, those early attempts to mm. to make a film originated 30 years ago in a film school when I was 20 years old. Mm. So that is a long answer to your No, no, to no, question. that's totally Thank fine. You. Because uh, we, in a way that um, I found a few interviews, and now I'm not, I'm not sure if they are kind of a legit now, if the information isn't very up to date. Because I do have a, uh, a question that is sort of coming from an interview back in 2010 about Shia Chinese. Uh, so that will be my second question. And so again, it's quoted from the title of the, of the interview from The Guardian. Uh, it says, um, filmmaker and author Xiaolu Guo's uh, Locano winning feature, Shia Chinese, was shot and funded in London. But the young director tells Jeffrey McNabb, uh, the interviewer, the young director remains skeptical about whether there's really room in the market for East Asian or subtitled films. Um, the, so, and then in the same article, the interview kind of quoted you saying that it seems that um, uh, the English market seems to doesn't care about the, the subject or the subtitled film. But then this is an interview that was kind of quoted back in 2010. So I'm wondering, do you think that thing, has things been changed in the past 10, 20, 10, no, not 20, 10, 12 years or so in the yeah, decade? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really a really good question. That's really also like pressing question for Chinese art, you know, literature, cinema, you know, how, how they are doing, you know, in, in Britain, because it's very different in West Europe, mm. and it's also very different in East Europe, and it's also different in, in America. Mm. Uh, my feeling is they're still very difficult because I wrote the last several books in English, which is the language of, of mine. Um, they're doing okay, but you know, still it's my second language to write in English. And the, my books are more or less all right in Britain, but it's you know, struggling, commercially speaking, you know, it really mm. doesn't exist. Mm. But cinema, if you make independent cinema from non anglophone world, I think it's as difficult as your Turkish Iranian independent filmmaker or independent filmmaker from Africa or, or say from you know a very important country, Japanese cinema or Korean cinema. I mean they're huge in Asia or mm -hmm. even you know they take over some of Hollywood cinema, but but still, I think I think Anglophone reception is something else. You know I think there's a large audience there. But uh, we are speaking from non-distribution network, which means if you're a filmmaker, you, you really know how difficult to, to make a film and then to enter the commercial distribution network, because mm. you have nothing to do with cinema network. Mm. And I made 12 films, mostly long feature films. And even though all of my films were in very big film festivals, like Sundance or or, or Vienna or Venice Film Festival, but they have never really released in British commercial cinema. You know, they were in the in the good academic you know, film festivals or independent film festivals. They were circulating in the classroom, but you know they are never 
really in the commercial cinema. And I think you are, you are just realistic after you've made so many films. You know where you are and you know that is a limitation, you know, as an independent filmmaker, um, whether you make Anglophone speaking film or Chinese speaking film, you know, it's really to do with genre and the mainstream film distribution network. Mm. So, yeah, so that's sort of, I prepared this couple of questions to begin with uh, so the Q&A session, but I kind of want to maybe for now to pass on, uh, open the question to the floor, open to the floor, and, uh, and then we can come back to me later. So. Yes, please raise your hands there. Oh, there's a question here. I shall show them. My name is Cecilia, and I'm, I was very uh, glad to have the opportunity to see your film today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And um, I just wanted to uh, ask, uh, as well as Godard, I saw, I don't know if I'm, uh, you know, if this is a um, deliberate reference or if maybe it's just an echo of uh, Kathy Come Home by Ken Loach. I felt that uh, the structure of the film, which is uh, sort of lead one situation leading into another into another in a downward spiral and the relationship between a woman and the city and uh, of course there's the traveling but I don't know if you've seen Kathy come home it's a it's an important reference and I you know because you studied in in the UK film in the UK as well I thought maybe this could be a reference so I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that as well as Agnès Vardas um, cinema, if that if it was important for you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, very good question. I I didn't hear the whole thing, you know, because it's quite far distance. You know, <laughs> but I, I I made I made out uh, the reference to Ken Loach and Agnes Varda. Yeah, um, I love their cinema. Uh, Ken Loach is one of my heroes. Uh, I might feel more close to Agnes Varda um, because I think her essay films more perhaps more feminine and maybe maybe politically not that direct. There's kind of layers of feminine indirectness to the political, social um, scenes. But both, I, I love their cinema, of course. I don't think Xiu Chinese has this direct re reference to either of these directors, but I would say really, you know, the school in my mind is really is, it belongs to non-narrative, no, kind of non-classical filmmaking, which means I, I think I feel very comfortable to watch a film, you know, has constant disturbance or constant distraction, you know, draw me out from this narrative dream, which is really pulled out, you know, kind of paved by traditional Hollywood cinema, because I don't really trust that kind of very traditional, completely sealed, um, narrative and I think that's why I think with Shi Chinese I deliberately create these 16 chapters um, to just to stop that flow of the smooth narrative because I think you know you can only narrate a story in say you know 37 way or depend <laughs> depending which kind of intellectual school you come from you know my my Russian intellectual kind of film school training <laughs> is saying okay you have 12 ways of telling a story you know or 37 ways of telling a story um, but I think for me the new way of of telling story is to interfere the smooth narrative to wake up the audience from the seats therefore they stop consume the story in a passive way they start to think about the journey of the character and how the filmmaker tried to shape that journey because I think it's it's an illusion, you know, the story without subjectivity. So I try to remind the audience that subjectivity from behind this camera. And so the, I think for me, the most important is the fragmented chapter headings in Shia Chinese. Therefore, I can, you know, have this space to jump, to move forward. Uh, because to shape her journey in the story, I don't need to tell you know some part of transition. How did he come? She did she come here, or how she managed to go that place? How did she meet this person, that person? I think I just jump those kind of. It could be very trivial transition narrative point, and I think that is also very you know similar to my other films. I think most of my documentary films there are the chapter headings to stop the flow of the narrative. Uh, and the same thing with my, all my novels. I think you could hardly read without being <laughs> interrupted by the author. And uh, you know, I think that's really very much from 60, 60s 
um, that kind of, you know, Novavak tradition and also, you know, say Italian literature from that time, you know, Carvino and, uh, you know, also Pasolini cinema, Pasolini's poetry. And also, I think just that generation of Duras, um, the ones who made the film and wrote novels. And I think that's clear, a kind of intellectual inf interference to, to an, a passive story, you know. Um, and you mentioned Agnes Vada, you know, it's really very coherent in my study of, you know, of, of cinema. Hello, Charlie. Uh, can I follow up that discussion about um, the chapters? And yeah. uh, you're, you, I was thinking about uh, Vado as well when I was watching the film. Um, the, it's, it's not just about interruption of time. There's also uh, an introduction of a particular tonality or tone in the expression of the language in the subtitles, mm -hmm. which is not the same tone as the refusal of language that the protagonist has. Could you say something about the relationship between the, the written language and the lack of spoken language in the images? Yeah, yeah that's an a expert question. <laughs> I, think, I think film sub subtitling is really a um, very tricky and a very really overlooked subject, you know, between the literature and, and the cinema study. Um, and by accident, I think all my films are subtitled <laughs> because now I live in the West. So, and, uh, you know, one of my films, We Want Wonderland, there's about six different subtitles because text is in the middle of the images, not underneath the images. So text as a main narrative force for the images. Um, but regarding your question, I think I came from this strange uh, kind of school, which um, I, I have to say, you know, in my film study in Beijing, which is very different from National Film School in the UK, I think we we almost kind of recite, <laughs> recite, you know, um, Bresson's, Bresson's this famous little book called The Notes of Cinemat Cinematography. And in, in Bresson's idea, you know, cinema should be completely divorced from theater and literature. Therefore, the film language is language nothing to do with text or adaptation of, of a literary story or theater. Uh, and the film language shouldn't, shouldn't be connected to dialogues, the beauty of dialogues. Uh, it should connect to the visual, visual montage, right? Montage as language uh, without text. And I think on one hand, I really loved the idea in you know, cinema as, as different language. Uh, away from traditional verbal form, um, that that I tr you know I try to do with all my films, like in Xi Chinese, in the UK part they don't speak at all, um, very little. But on the other hand, I have been always in love with the, the text in the in the in the cinema as kind of, I guess again sixties European film tradition, you know it seems text and visual has this powerful dialogue in that kind of cinema, especially in Duras, you know, in Duras or Godard cinema. Um, occasionally in Agnes Vada cinema, but Vada is more post 60, let's say, you know. So in Godard cinema, in, in Duras cinema, <laughs> you had to do both, you know. So, so I'm just to this contradiction of that, I think that aesthetics, you know. Um, so with Shia Chinese, although they don't speak much, uh, with my film sub subtitles, I try to capture what's unsaid, what's, what might be misunderstood for the audience, uh, which is very interesting. You know, I think I had this liberty as, as a film director to do the subtitle, um, which also created a lot of mistakes, of course, you know as a non-native English speaker. But on the other hand, I was very acutely aware, you know, what the audience would get if you can't understand the original language, you know, what should be said, um, complementary to the images. So ordinary speaking, you wouldn't do that um, if you are in the, in the more Hollywood system, you know, the producer, the production will do the subtitles. 
director cannot rewrite subtitles. So <laughs> I think you're very sharp pointing out that, um, you know, this is kind of poetic lesson, license I, I took the liberty without being, um, you know, questioned uh, as an independent filmmaker. Um, I think another case, which is quite extreme in one of my films called one of uh, UFO in her eyes, uh, because all the, they are all street people, you know, real peasants. They play themselves as, as peasants or farmers on their land in that film called the UFO in her eyes. So it's, they spoke Guangxi dialect, <laughs> which no, no, none of us could understand. Um, and then, so during the filming, I just let, you know, let them speak. And I more or less made, made out what they say, you know, according to my script. But I think in the final subtitling, in English, I just reduced to minimal, you know, rough meaning what they said in their dialect. Um, it's very funny sometimes. Um, if you could understand Guangxi dialect, you say, well, there's slightly difference, or there's huge difference between what they said and what they subtitled. And I think that's just one of the, you know, strange and crazy um, kind of outcome if you work with different language, you know, uh, not necessarily written language, you know, if you work with dialects in a book or in a film format, um, you have to translate, you know, even you have to translate into Mandarin if they spoke some local dialect, you know, in a Chinese film. Um, and, I, and I said that is really overlooked area because it's, it could be very interesting, rich, you know, for, for scholars, for linguists to study, you know, the, 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 what's in, what, what's out, what's been left unsaid, what, what is being manifested in a large form, you know. Um, I think that is really, you know, to do with interpretation and the translation. I'm very fascinated myself to, uh, towards that subject. Yep. We have another, yeah, another question. Hi, uh, Xiao Lu, thank you so much for making this film. My name is Xiaoning Lu. I teach uh, Chinese cinema uh, and a culture at SOAS. So uh, my question is a follow up of, uh, of the previous one regard with regard to interpretation of your film. I was intrigued by your use of the title, Xi Chinese. Uh, of course, you explained uh, your long journey of how to adapt and revise your, uh, your, your film script. I understand there is an intertextuality, you know, uh, intertextual reference to Godard's film. But on the other hand, as an audience member, especially when this film is distributed in Europe, in the Western world, you know, you are telling a very individual story. Uh, but then you are giving this like a title, Chinese. Right, and you have the individual and the national and the ethnic identity, the label they put them together. So I'm, I'm, on, I'm, I'm just thinking about, I'm wondering, what is your positionality when you tell this story? Uh, because you yourself, very similar to Li Mei, uh, you are also diasporic Chinese. So my question is really about, what's your positionality yeah. when you tell this yeah. story? So that's really, yeah, I think it's, it's a question a lot of people ask. Actually, it's really um, interesting and complex. Um, I never had this title until the producer said, you must use different title from your original title. And I think my original title was La Chinoise, uh, I think 80 years later, something like that. And then the, the French producer didn't like, it. I think I'm telling you about how arbitrary the whole filmmaking business is, is even though you are independent filmmaker from you know, a faraway place, but you end up working in a European context with different producers from very different cultural, um, you know, linguist background. I think the French producer was saying something very different. I think, I think at the one point, our film title was The Desperate Kingdom of Love. And I, th I think because that was also one of the songs PJ Harvey had, the, the title is Desperate Kingdom of Love. And I think that was my favorite title, but we couldn't use it, I think, because of the copyrights issue or something, you know. And I, I also remember, you know, those, I think the filmmaking process is, in a way, it's nothing to do with me at the also, and nothing to do with this academic idea of some kind of national identity. It's about how we can make a film somehow you know, retain my some original plan for the film, but also to be collaborative, you know, to respect other 
other people working on this film, you know, because you, you will work with 60 people and some are much smarter than me and some are French, some are English and some are German producers. And I remember the German title was something very, something not significant, I think. I think something called she, something like a Chinese girl, which I just couldn't care less because for me, this kind of dumbed down, simplistic version is just so strange for me. But I think when a film was distributed in different countries, they decide what's put on their film posters without even consulting me because I don't own the film rights. So producers have the film rights. And I think that is how difficult to make a film in a, in a, in a foreign land, even though some are shot in China, but you know, Chinese shooting was only 12 days. And the most stuff we are done in Germany and, and UK and France. Um, but I think my original title was always La Chinoise, some, you know, something like 80 years later, um, according to you know, which year you were writing the script. Um, and I remember it was very funny, I wanted to send my script to Godard because we got this address, Godard still living in this little village near Lausanne, <laughs> in, in the French speaking um, area in Switzerland between Lausanne and Geneva. And someone was saying, well, we can get an address, send a script to Godard, and then if, he, if he's very pleased with your script, we can use our title as a proof. And we never got the answer, of course. And how cool is that? You know, that of course, Jean-Luc Godard would never answer. I, I wouldn't. But anyway, so we couldn't really use that title. Um, but I would. I think he would be cool with me, with me. But anyway, so I think the rest was just a really very complex, um, you know, I think suggestion from producers and I think depend, depends who's more powerful really. And for me, it's nothing to do with national identity or that. And all I wanted to make film to do with um, individual as kind of existential being without putting on those supposed national identities, supposed cultural identities. She could be a boy, she could be a, a gay man and she could be a character from you know, American indie film called My Own Private Idaho uh, or Midnight Cowboy. And I remember before we began to shoot the film, I asked my film crews, which I had 50 people, I said, um, here's a film list you have to watch, including Jean Godard's La Chinoise, but second one is My Own Private Idaho, the, the indie American film. And then the third one was Midnight Cowboy. And I remember that people were asking me why. And I said, because she, she doesn't need to be any nationality. She should be a youth, completely naked in terms of adopting nationality. It's about the youth running away of this straight jacket of nationality, of, of identities. Um, and, and it's very naughty and almost paradoxical. You know, we, we call the film title in such an arbitrary way, but she, you know, the film title could be something else, depends you know, which producer got power that day. <laughs> So um, it's, it's really interesting, complex process, but I was not, I was never interested in the national identities. I think it's so important to reveal a naked youth questioning her own ontology or her own anxiety of, of existence in this world as an adult. And it's really an essay about adulthood and by accident, she is it's a young woman, you know, and she could be a young man if I was man, you know, it's more automatic to relate to, to her as, as, as a young woman. So I hope, I mean, really my intention is, is everyone feel, you know, it's a part of story of their, their brother or sister coming out from a little village in France or in a little village in Mexico and then came to New York, you know, a similar kind of story. It's a youth coming of age story, really. Oh, hi, Charlotte. It's uh, Mark. We have a, a question in the chat I'd like to draw attention to you. So it's from uh, Anupma. So Anupma, uh, Anupma says, uh, Hi, Charlotte. I absolutely loved the film. And I particularly liked how nuanced all the male characters were. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose so many male characters at various stages of life in the story? Uh, because despite the, uh, the unagreeable acts, I found myself empathizing with them on a deeper level, which is really a remarkable thing to accomplish. <laughs> Was that a deliberate effort when penning the story? That's fantastic. I love this. <laughs> Thank you for, for, the, for this question. Um, yeah, it's, uh, 
it's almost like anti-debate questions, wonderful. Um, I think, I think, you know, it's quite automatic because I wrote a story when I was very young, you know, and I think your positioning of, of the, the protagonist is often so related to your own position, you know, and I think, you know, especially, I guess, in my early years, I grew up in a very forbidden environment, you know, I might be a feminist in my mind, but bodily speaking, I was just 17th century, not even 18th century. <laughs> so my physical experience was in starvation um, in terms of you know, sex sexuality, in terms of world experience, in terms of lived embodied experience, right? And even though I could speak something about feminism, but that's nothing to do with my lived experience, which is real and much more powerful in a way. So I thought about to write a character, you know, going through the world, through her body, you know, and in a way she's like a body artist without being putting on that title, you know, she's just a simple, almost primitive body person, you know, going through world, um, going through her youth in such a, you know, from, from a ethical moralistic point of view, you know, it's violent process. I mean, in my eyes, it's not violent, it's, is somehow really, you know, it represents how a lot, a lot of young women, you know, have gone through in, in their youth, especially, you know, the older generations, you know, but I don't believe, you know, younger generation have complete opposite experience because I think the world largely still have this problematic structure, you know, um, about youth, about being women, you know, so, so that's why I think the process of her is going through these different males in different stage of life, different age and different location. Um, but also I was thinking about, I think what, you know, you mentioned early on, you know, some of you mentioned against Vada. Um, I loved one of Vada's film, I think it's called Vagabond. Um, Vagabond, and it's about these young women really kind of street, you know, street, what, well, it's a wrong concept because I'm using some Chinese concept. She's, she's on the road, this kind of radical, uncompromised, naked being, refuse all the kind of supposed traditional identities. You know, she's this ontological anxiety on the road as a young woman going through this violent male landscape. I was very much, kind of influenced by that film as well, you know, and I think I couldn't make film well, um, that absolute, like a background by, by against Vada, but I could film, you know, about the girl from a village agricultural landscape, going through industrial landscape and she gave it up and she came to more post industrial landscape, which is England. And then eventually she gave it up, you know, because she, she's really a symbol of, um, existential angst, and that's not, I'm pretending to say that word, but it's the absolute human anxiety as just a doubt. You are living in this existential perpetual angst, how to deal with life as an adult, you know, whether you're a young, young man or woman, you know, how to deal with life, whether it's foreign or native. Um, so it's 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 very tough um, question. So. I think you listed, you know, her journey. Um, you know, you can say, okay, she has an oriental pattern. You know, that's of course. You know, we are we are victim of the nation, national identity. You know, but I sort of refuse that limitation because I think she could be a very simply, you know, a Latin American girl. You know, come from you know outside of San Diego and you know, try to get to capital in, in Chile, or she could be growing up in a very deprived uh, Midwest America and try to go to San Francisco or, or New York and going through that road trip, which can be even more violent <laughs> than maybe going through male and female rather than just males. I think just all these are possible, you know, it just happened. I had to choose a girl from Beijing, for example. <laughs> so um, the point, you know, when you mentioned you are making a point here, of course, you know, but I guess my point are multiple in a way, you know, my points are more than one. Um, but I think, you know, 
a lot of intellectual inference, you know, for example, when I, when I was younger, you know, when I was reading Duras, you know, for example, the most commercial titles, I love it from Duras. I think, you know, one of the main thing is about love between men and women is a battle, whether you, in the lover, she is a French girl, and the man is a Chinese Indonesian, in, in Indochina girl, a boy. But the theme is about love is such a kind of battle between the two, two persons, you know, whether you're both male or a, a male and a female. And I think it represents the end of human relation. You know, it's it's a violent, intimate relationship. You know, um, so those are my real kind of footnote in a way. You know, when I make that film. Thank you. Okay. And we have a, another question in the chat. I think there's a little bit of crossover in the answer that you've just sort of given, but it's from uh, uh, Xu Zhen. So, hi Jalo, thanks for being with us. Transcultural love emerges as an important theme in your novels and films. Is there an intention in your writing to deconstruct the Madame Butterfly or White Knight paradigm that is often found in Western literary and cinematic representations of Asian women, white men relationships, or at least an intention to create a dialogue with these paradigms in the attempt to resist essentialist views of Chinese women? Yeah, that's an amazing reference. Um, I mean, no, oh, Madame Butterfly, wow, <laughs> why tonight? Well, they are, they're groundwork. Um, I think I was just crossing, uh, you're looking at both questions. So I wonder if I spoke about those points. Um, cause, yeah, yeah, I just, uh, I'm not very good to read, read in the chat when I'm speaking and I'm looking at the audience online. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, um, writing to deconstruct, you know, I mean, this is very flattering, you know, what you said. Um, I, I think you know, because the film was written quite a while ago, you know, when I was much younger, you know, when you're younger, you, I guess you don't, your ambition is different, you know, perhaps, you know, in my age now, you know, I would have a sort of more intellectual ambition challenge a certain kind of classical work, but because I have read and seen, you know, quite a lot in the last 20, 30 years, you know, after I you know, left university. But when I was younger, you know, it's, it's very direct, automatic, primitive energy to say, look, I want to make a film about this um, coming from my experience, my observation of my generation, you know, it's really uh, quite um, physical, you know. Um, I mean, that's why I mentioned that word early on, you know, body artist, um, because they, they really react from within their lived experience, right? And maybe they don't have to, you know, know, you know, James Joyce work or, <laughs> you know, or um, Puccini's work um, to make a, a remark in their books or films, you know. So I was really just merely thinking about, you know, the reverse journey we did, you know, instead of looking at the East, you know, we, we are in the East, we, you know, we came to the West. And what, what is that journey mean, you know, means to, to, to many of us, because that's a journey barely portrayed, right, in the cinema, um, but it's a lot in the, in the novels. You know, and so I wanted to do that, you know, reverse journey of, of you know, looking at the East, but I want to look at the West and that physical journey. Um, so your question, yeah, um, there's a scene in which Rashid, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so you mentioned that Rashid scene, yeah, Oriental go, And I think that is really, um, almost like stereotype, you know, how a Western-based person looking at Eastern culture, you know, it's so obvious that, <laughs> it's, you know, I, maybe it doesn't need more anal analysis, um, even though Rashid is not entirely from the West, but he shares, you know, mainstream Western culture about the East in a way. Um, I just thought that was so obvious how, you know, 
the misunderstanding between the West and the East. And why shouldn't they? Because they are living in this baggaged culture, you know, in the, in the, you know, in the media, you know, we live in this media language presented already, you know, constructed already, you know, without authentic personal experience. And perhaps Rashid would have different experience after May left <laughs> in this film, which I left on filmed and um, edited in the final film. Yeah, thank you. So, Hi, Xiaolu. Thanks so much for being with us again. It's always a great privilege and we are always learning from your films and your literature. Um, I have been following your journey and my last um, uh, incursion into your work was A Lover's Discourse. Um, yeah, Bart again and the French literature and so much more. But it's again autofiction very much. Um, it's very self-referential and it's grounded in reality. And the, the question of you, I could almost get a lover's discourse and go to Hackney and go to the Regent's Canal and look at the barges. I can see everything that is in that book. Uh, it's, it's a guide into a situation that is absolutely real, even though there is a lot of fiction. I'm sure if I went to Germany, where the character comes from, I would find all the locations there again, <laughs> including his uh, drawings, architectural drawings and everything. And Shia Chinese, needless to say, you, you can walk through London and locate all those places that are there and if I went to China and to that village I would find the mud and the truck and the types that are there exactly as that. So I wonder the role that autofiction and realism play in your work and whether one day you want to explode all that and just invent some uh, a fantasy in, in a Wonderland or something like that. Wonderland is already a name of one of your f films, which are not Wonderland at all. So tell me more about the question of reality in your film. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your um, comments, uh, which is yeah very warm. Um, you know, uh, have audience and readers like you. Um, I, I think. I think after writing a few books and after you come through, you know, you're no longer a, a 20 something years old author, you, you do looking, you know, back in a more historical way. And I think, you know, it's very, I didn't believe that before, but, <laughs> but the last few years I really realized, you know, my direction change, you know, it's it's very interesting. For example, currently I work on a book to do with <laughs> Battle of Hastings, which is a thousand years ago, the event. And why a foreigner like me, you know, writing a, you know, a, a, a book, you know, based in England, you know, a thousand years ago, because I think it's a certain kind of recognition of my adopted culture here. But also I think one grows such a fascination to something although looks remote but very relevant to your current life you know so you become a bit more you know intellectual more symbolic and less so you know automatic direct less so physical um and i think with with filmmaking the same you know more and more away from personal story i think you know not only because the age changes your narrative. It's more, I guess, the depth of lived experience. You know, I can't see I have one lived experience. You know, I do see I have a few very different life experience in different culture. Um, and, and, and as you mentioned, you know, the, the German part in Lover's Discourse in my last novel, because I, I did live in Germany on and off and I'm still commuting in Germany, North Germany. And I think that's very interesting part of my life, you know, another language, the third language which I'm trying to learn, but those are very different history and culture. And how do I make sense of that culture in my narrative, you know, through film and the books, is to construct something slightly, you know, beyond my personal life, you know. So 
I think that changes an author's style in a way uh, and her way of, you know, narrating um, a story or non-story. So I can't say, you know, what what my next book might look like, you know, but but I guess I'm more interested in in history in non-narrative format, for example, um, a non-direct personal experience. But on the other hand, every experience is personal and a physical experience. Even you narrate a story from a thousand years ago, you know, because it's through your own imagination and your physical experience, right? Um, but the, the themes are much larger or, or, or less so immediate, you know, to, to, to my current life. So I hope I will present some very new and strange work next year. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. What a great pleasure to be with you. Keep writing the beautiful things you do. Staying in this world or going to another world, stay with us and do more. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>